Uh, good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the, uh, this Director's Forum with Ambassador Richard Morningstar. I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Center. Um, established by an act of Congress in 1968, the Woodrow Wilson Center is the nation's official living memorial to the 28th President. Uh, we were founded to honor and build upon his legacy as a man who bridged the divide between scholarship and public policy. Uh, we are a public-private institution relying on a federal appro appropriation for roughly one-third of what it takes to keep this place going and raising privately two-thirds of what we need. Uh, we do two things here. Um, we put on about 800 meetings a year and we welcome during the course of the year about 150 scholars and policymakers from all over the world who come here to do their own research and writing. We bring together the thinkers and the doers, the policymakers, the scholars, the business leaders, and the hope and belief that a frank and open dialogue will lead to better understanding, better cooperation, and better public policy. It is this kind of dialogue that we hope to engage in this morning with the Director's Forum. Ambassador Morningstar's appearance marks the launch of a series of activities uh, specifically on European and Eurasian energy issues. This new European energy uh, security initiative at the center will include a European energy security forum, a monthly series of public meetings with expert speakers. It will include an energy security working group and, we hope, a set of publications, including an annual report on Europe's energy future. We invite all of you to join us for these events. Let me say a word of thanks to our former scholar, Alexo, uh, Alexandros Pe Peterson, uh, who, for working um, with the European program in developing this initiative. We are grateful to Ambassador Morningstar for joining us for this launch. The Ambassador has had a distinguished career in public service as well as academia and the private sector. Prior to being appointed by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton as the Special Envoy for Eurasian Energy, he lectured at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and Stanford Law School and taught at Brown University and Boston College Law School. From uh, June 1999, um, to September 2001, he served as the United States Ambassador to the European Union. Prior to this, <clears throat> Ambassador Morningstar served as Special Advisor to the President and Secretary of State for Caspian Basin Energy Diplomacy, where he was responsible for ensuring maximum coordination within the executive branch and with other government and international organizations to promote United States policy on Caspian Basin energy development and transportation. From 1995 until 19, uh, 1998, he, <clears throat> he represented this country as ambassador and special advisor to the President and Secretary of State on assistance to the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union, where he oversaw all U.S. bilateral assistance and trade uh, investment activities in the region. Ambassador Morningstar has had a variety of other experiences in the public-private sector. Very much in the Wilsonian mold, Ambassador Morningstar has written extensively on foreign, foreign policy, international law, and energy issues. His numerous writings include articles on uh, law in the international arena, on the Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan pipeline, and one entitled The Great Game, an Opportunity for Transatlantic Cooperation. The ambassador earned his B.A. from Harvard University and his J.D. from Stanford Law School. The ambassador has agreed to take some questions after his initial remarks. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the center. We appreciate your being here, um, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Michael, for your kind introduction, and, and also congratulations on your new initiative. And uh, needless to say, I think it's really important, <laughs> given, all the, given all the stuff that I've been working on. Um, I apologize if any of you heard my speech in Istanbul two weeks ago because uh, although, the, although different, it's quite similar. Uh, I've told Alexandros, who was there, that uh, he can listen to his iPhone during this speech. Uh, but, uh, but in any event, I will go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> when 
When I began uh, my job as the European Energy Envoy 18 months ago, I had thought a lot, I thought that a lot had changed uh, since I had last worked on these issues back in uh, 1998 or ni 99 during the Clinton administration, as Michael mentioned in his introduction. Uh, the respective roles uh, of Russia and Europe, the relative importance of gas uh, versus oil, uh, the emergence uh, of an LNG spot market, uh, development of shale, uh, expectations uh, for the global economy, which changed had changed so much, just to name just to name a few examples. But over the last year and a half, uh, the landscape uh, has changed even more dramatically. Uh, and at a much faster pace. Uh, shale, which I just mentioned, uh, had been really mentioned, and just even over the past 18 months, it's become such a, uh, it's been a huge development in this country as well as in uh, possibly in uh, Europe and in Eurasia. Uh, energy cooperation between Russia and Ukraine uh, looked improbable 18 months ago. Uh, few would have guessed that suppliers like Russia would be willing to uh, renegotiate take or pay perm, uh, take, uh, take or pay terms uh, of existing of existing agreements. Yet all all this has happened in a very short time uh, since I've held this position, and really very quickly. The lesson I draw from this is that any serious effort uh, to address uh, the complex and interrelated problems uh, of Eurasian energy must be informed by humility. Uh, trends that look obvious today can reverse and quickly. Uh, to give you a very brief example, the Energy Information Administration, which is part of DOE, does a forecast every five years. In 2005, the forecast was how, about how much LNG the U.S. would be importing, um, and shale wasn't mentioned. In the 2010 forecast, of course, shale became a major factor, and the forecast said there'd be very little LNG imported uh, to the United States. So things do change uh, rapidly. And with that said, you can't plan without making some, uh, some basic assumptions. And these assumptions need to be based on a clear-eyed clear analysis. There are certain realities, I think, and, and, and let, me share, uh, let me share a few of those and, uh, and give you my sense of what we're facing in our work on Eurasian energy during the, uh, during the period ahead. First of all, <coughs> we are moving uh, out of the world of zero-sum. And we have to move out of the world of zero sum. Over the past decade or so, there, have, there may have been moments when, when one player uh, or another had the cash or clout uh, to pull along, uh, pull along others uh, on specific projects. Not anymore. Today, political will, while a necessary condition, is not alone sufficient for realizing major projects. The orderly, efficient transportation of energy throughout the Eurasian marketplace will ultimately be driven by commercial realities, which is another way of saying big ideas need to be bankable. At the risk of stating the obvious, some of the major projects that have been on the drawing boards for some time now are breathtakingly expensive. Given the uncertainty of energy markets, the aftershocks <coughs> uh, of the global financial crisis, finding financing for big new projects will more than ever require a sound business case, one that not only makes sense in terms of economics, but that factors in political and other risks. And that implies that in the short to the midterm, that the smart approach to energy security particularly for specific countries or regions, may be local and incremental, an approach that focuses on getting the most out of existing infrastructure and opportunities. That's why we've been doing several things. We've been working with the EU uh, to help make Ukraine's tr gas transit system more reliable. That's a whole subject in itself, which you may want to ask about. We've also engaged with Russia on a range of issues, including fresh discussions on energy security, efficiency, tech and technology, uh, as well as investment issues uh, in Russia, as well as Russian investment in the United States. And we're doing this through the U.S.-Russia 
bilateral presidential commission, uh, which uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton is coordinating on the U.S. side. We've worked with international oil companies, along with Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, to develop a means to move the anticipated increase in Kazakh oil, Kazakh oil production to world, uh, to world markets. We facilitated exchanges of information and expertise on emerging technologies like shale gas, where the U.S. has unique experience. In fact, we now have a global shale initiative that we're working with many countries on. We've been working with Central and Eastern European countries to take a more coordinated approach to their energy security and moving forward with their plans for interconnectors, gas storage facilities, and LNG terminals. We've been working through the newly formed EU-US Energy Council to boost transatlantic energy cooperation on strategic issues so that we have consistent messages when we're dealing with Ukraine, when we're dealing with Iraq, when we're dealing with the Southern Corridor, and, and also working uh, on other issues relating to security of supply and advancing clean energy technologies and efficiency programs. Within Europe as a whole, we also understand that there's much that can be done in terms of connecting gas and electric power networks and building gas storage facility that can pay significant dividends in return for relatively minimal new investment. Indeed, the EU has committed several billion euros for investment in such facilities. The EU has also correctly recognized that improving energy efficiency, investing in renewables, and liberalizing energy markets can make a real difference in the near term. These efforts may be more important than any specific pipeline. And I want to emphasize that, that, that yeah, and I'll get more into it, pipelines can be very important, but much more will be done as far as Europe's energy security by what they're able to do internally, and they are working at it. The reality is, though, that there will remain pla a place in the Eurasian energy security picture for new major infrastructure projects. Demand for Eurasian energy in Europe will ultimately exceed the ability of existing infrastructure to supply it. There is nothing that comes close to matching the reliability and economies of scale that large capacity dedicated pipelines or similar fixed in infrastructure can provide. So what's our policy uh, with respect to these pipeline issues? It would appear that there are a lot of people out there who would agree with my last point. There are more than a dozen projects at various stages of discussion. South Stream, White Stream, Med Stream, Blue Stream 2, an Arab pipeline, pipelines from Qatar, from northern Iraq, from Samson to Jehan, from Burgos to Alexandropolis, from Turkmenistan to India, and of course Nabucco, ITGI, <coughs> and TAP. It's a confusing picture, and not all of these projects will get off the drawing board in view of the realities that I've been talking about. But nonetheless, the Obama administration's approach to the plethora of projects is grounded in certain core principles. First, Europe's energy security is in America's national interest, and America's energy security is in Europe's interest because our economies are so interdependent and so interlinked. Second, diversity is good. Just as in investing, having alternatives in, source, in terms of sources of energy, uh, of energy, suppliers, transit options, ultimately is going to benefit all players. And the best solutions in the end are those that the market produces. Uh, likely, it's likely that they're going to in the end be the only solutions. So as I look forward, it's clear that we're going to be entering and are entering what will be an especially important period for Eurasian energy particularly as it relates to the diversity of gas supplies for Europe. Uh, indeed, the, uh, in some respects, the period immediately ahead, meaning the next six months to a year, will be decisive. What do I mean by that? Uh, I think that fundamentally a number of things are going to become clear. First of all, there will be a southern energy corridor. I have absolutely no doubt of that. The gas from the Caspian is going to go west. The June 7th conclusion of the Turkish-Azeri gas purchase transit agreement removed 
the last major uncertainty regarding terms for moving su uh, substantial volumes uh, of Azeri gas across Anatolia. On that basis, the Shak Deniz II consortium, which is developing a large offshore gas field in the Caspian, is moving ahead with their project planning. Negotiations with potential buyers and shippers are underway. Potential shippers of Shak Deniz gas, the Nabucco, ITGI, and TAP consortia, are lining up financing and putting in place the organizational structure to transport the gas. Sometime between now and next spring, maybe later, the Shak Deniz II consortium will decide which of these three groups vying to ship its gas to European markets gets the nod. Again, a southern corridor is going to happen. Second, it's going to become clear in the months ahead whether Turkmenistan will contribute to the southern corridor by shipping gas across the Caspian by pipeline uh, or will choose to focus on other routes for diversifying its energy exports, <clears throat> such as the TAPI project, which has been much in the news lately. That's the Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, I'm sorry, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. The Nabucco Consortium, uh, supported by the EU, uh, has worked hard to elicit a firm commitment from Ashgabat uh, to ship the gas west. And for our part, uh, we've supported the concept of a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline since the 90s. But Turkmenistan, for its own political reasons, and it is a sovereign country, may not be ready to commit to a pipeline. Given that the Shak Deniz Consortium is looking to make their decisions in the next six months or so, uh, other sources of gas must be considered. This leads to the next point, and it's becoming clearer to us that for bringing gas into the southern corridor from point south is going to be important and may be actually more promising in the end than gas from Turkmenistan. At some point, hopefully sooner rather than later, a new government will be formed in Iraq, we hope that a priority of that new government will be ending the long-standing long stalemate between Baghdad and Erbil on uh, hydrocarbon law and on a revenue-sharing agreement. This would not only bring important benefits to Iraq in terms of further development of its oil and gas infrastructure, it would also allow for a serious discussion <clears throat> of how to bring Iraqi gas into the southern corridor. Now, let's be clear, it's not going to be easy. Iraqi domestic priorities must first be sorted out, and in our view, any scheme for exporting resources from the north must be endorsed by Iraq's central government. Uh, and there's also agreement, by the way, on that from Turkey and from the European Union and member states. But there also seems to be a consensus among experts <coughs> that Iraq has ample gas in the north and in the south. <coughs> and once these reserves are developed, Iraq should be able to meet its domestic demand with significant volumes left over for export. And we shouldn't forget, in fact, it was somewhat stunning to me, last year, on July 13th, when the Nabucco IGA was signed, intergovernmental agreement was signed in Ankara, uh, uh, Prime Minister Maliki was there, and he said that Iraq could provide 15 BCM of gas to Nabucco. I might say also, just in the past week, BP and Sokar, a uh, state oil company of Azerbaijan, uh, have reached an agreement on more projects in Azerbaijan, which will mean, if successful, it still has to be explored and produced, BP and Sokar will have much more gas going to the market, thus making large pipeline projects uh, more attractive. Having said that, commercial issues will still ultimately determine which projects go ahead and with which sources of gas. But for our part, we have always said that we support the Southern Corridor as a whole. And any of the three competing projects could, in our view, serve as the basis for that, car for that corridor. <clears throat> in the abstract, Nabucco would be preferable. It has clear advantages in terms of meeting the needs of consumers uh, in, Eastern, in uh, Eastern EU countries. Uh, a dedicated large pipeline like Nabucco operating to international standards would have important advantages over existing infrastructure and might be the most profitable solution if operated at full capacity. Remember, I said if operated at full capacity. 
That is, that's why it's important to line up additional early sources of gas from Iraq or elsewhere. I didn't mention Qatar and other possibilities uh, to the south of uh, uh, Turkey. The conundrum is that beefing up existing infrastructure could in the short term be the most effective way to handle initial shock to these two volumes. And again, this may prove easier said than done. At the same time, no one seriously questions that in the long term, improvements to current infrastructure will be inadequate to handle expanding European and Turkish demand. And as new gas sources become available for the southern corridor, it will ultimately need a way to get to the market. So the question naturally arises, is this an either-or moment? The short answer is that although governments will continue to play a role, and we certainly will, the markets will decide, or at least will have the strongest voice in making the decisions involved. But I also think it would be a mistake to rule out outcomes that incorporate through means like consolidation or staging the stronger points of the various consortia. Flexibility is going to be the key. The challenge of the months ahead is to get the southern corridor up and running in a way that reflects current gas availability, but that also allows room to grow and that meets in a timely manner the needs of Europe's less well-served consumers. The competing consortia's current business plans all fall short in one way or another of, me of meeting that challenge. You know, maybe this shouldn't be surprising, given that uh, all, three pro all three projects were conceived years ago in a very different environment. But momentous decisions on Shock Denis gas are coming up fast. And it may be time to take another look at the assumptions underlying the competing projects for transporting that gas. This is a time when commercial creativity is going to be necessary. And I believe that the project that ultimately has the most flexible approach is going to be the one that wins out. And I'm not prepared at this point to say which one it'll be, because there are going to be a lot of things that are going to happen um, in the meantime. And <clears throat> as I said at the opening of these remarks, a lot has changed with respect to Eurasian energy since I uh, got back into this line of work. Uh, but a constant has been the markets reward those who can best adapt to changes when circumstances require it. And uh, I will leave it at that, and uh, I can assure you this is has been consistently and will be consistently our policy. Thank you very much uh, for that opener. That uh, sets the stage. We have several people standing and sitting on the side. There are plenty of seats internally if you uh, want to take them. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions, and um, uh, we have uh, mics on both sides. Um, uh, yes, here. Uh, yeah. Identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, Brian Beery, journalist for Europolitics, European Affairs newspaper. Um, you mentioned briefly the EU-US uh, Energy Council. I believe they're going to meet the day before the NATO summit in Lisbon. Um, could you min m maybe say a little bit about w what you're going to talk about? And just on N N Nabucco again, is there a change in position here? Because my understanding was the previous U EU administration clearly said they, they preferred Nabucco um, over South Stream, but now you seem to be saying, you know, the market will decide, and just want if you can well, clarify. Well, I did, for, uh, just to clarify, let me go, go from back to front <laughs> as, far as, as far as your questions. First of all, <coughs> I didn't talk about South Stream when I was talking about the Southern Corridor. I was talking about the three other projects, Nabucco, ITGI, and TAP. I don't consider South Stream to be part of the Southern Corridor. Our position with respect to South Stream is that, it is that we don't oppose it, that it's up to the countries involved to make that determination. 
But I did not say, and it should not be ever inferred, that I was saying that we, uh, that we uh, don't favor Nabucco over South Stream. Because we do favor Nabucco over South Stream. But again, you know, ultimately, um, ultimately the markets uh, will decide. And I say that in all fairness. Our Russian friends would say they preferred South Stream over Nabucco. So, you know, uh, I don't, this isn't an area of contentiousness. I mean, I think it's just a, um, just a statement uh, of fact. Now, you ask whether there's been a change in position. I think there's been an evolution of position. I, I, I wouldn't say it's a huge change. I think our policy today is more balanced than it was during the prior administration. I think you're right that there was more emphasis on Nabucco uh, at that time. Uh, we still like Nabucco very much, but we again, we support the whole of the Southern Corridor. Uh, we want the project to take place that ultimately makes the most sense. It may well be Nabucco, and politically and strategically, there are, as I mentioned during my you know, presentation, uh, there are advantages to Nabucco, but, uh, uh, but there are also issues. And the other point that I would emphasize with respect to balance, and uh, I can't really emphasize too much, is the importance of what Europe does itself. Uh, and uh, what it does with respect to its internal markets, as I described because uh, earlier, because I think that even more than pipelines will ensure, uh, whatever the pipelines are, will ensure European uh, energy security. Um, with respect to the uh, uh, EU-US Energy Council, actually it's sort of interesting, we usually call it the EU-US Energy Council when we're in Europe, in the U.S., it's usually called the U.S. EU Energy Council, <laughs> but but for today, I guess I did call it the EU U.S. Energy Council. And they, given my de great deference to my European friends and all the time I've spent there, but um, it's not definite that there will be a ministerial around the summit. Uh, it, it's not set in stone. I certainly hope that will be the case. Um, and that will be a meeting that will include, that will be at the ministerial level. The co-chairs on the American side are Secretary of State Clinton and Secretary of Energy Chu. And on the European side, it would be Lady Ashton, Commissioner Ettinger, and uh, I, I believe a representative from the Belgian presidency, even post-Lisbon. Post um, <clears throat> I think the key point with respect to the Energy Council is what are we doing on an everyday basis, and I'll briefly describe it, but, but it, and it's certainly relevant to your program here. Uh, there are three working groups. Uh, I chair the working group on uh, uh, energy security, in which we do talk about on a constant basis what our approaches should be in dealing with Ukraine and dealing with Iraqi gas, and uh, we worked closely together to have a common position to help uh, help push ahead the Turk the Turkey Azerbaijan agreement that was signed in June you know those ty those types of sort of typical energy diplomacy kinds of issues but and I think we are on the same wavelength on on virtually all issues um, and then we have two working groups one that uh, both that well one that DOE Department of Energy chairs on technology research and technology oh and I sh excuse me I didn't mention the uh, commissioner of uh, uh, the commissioner for research and development uh, would be involved on the EU side commissioner Gagan okay. uh, anyway there are nine working groups working on on uh, uh, on various uh, cutting-edge projects. Uh, they're making significant progress. They'll report to the ministerial with respect to the progress that's being made. And then we have a, a, a committee on policy and regulatory framework that is co-chaired by the Department of Commerce, on our side, by the Department of Commerce and the Department of Energy. And uh, uh, and they look are looking at regulatory issues. And, uh, an important question, for example, is how do we uh, it, that it's important that we have a common regulatory framework with smart grids or electric cars or you know various new technologies, so that uh, uh, so that we'll have an open marketplace between uh, uh, between Europe and the uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we're working on. Maybe that's too long an answer, but you know. There it is. Uh, questions? Uh, Kent. Yeah. Yep. 
I'm Kent Hughes here at the Wilson Center. Uh, you mentioned the the role of technology in the shale uh, gas field. There's recently a Chinese investment in an American company motivated in part by gaining their access to that technology, hoping to apply it in China. Given their enormous uh, hard currency reserves and so forth, might you see some Chinese investment in this field in Europe? Uh, I, I, suppose, I suppose it's possible, uh, and that certainly made news here, and, and that they bought a third interest from Chesapeake, I guess, in a field in Texas uh, just o over the weekend. Um, and uh, I'm frankly, I'm not involved on the U.S. side of you know of these questions, so uh, I'm not directly involved or have much to say about it. And uh, uh, but there's certainly no reason why uh, uh, countries, why Russia, for example, you know, there's no reason why they couldn't invest in a shale field in the United States under our CFIUS regulations. Whether or not uh, there would be any question, any regulatory question on the Chinese investment, I, I really don't don't know at this point. I, I don't know of any, but I don't know. Uh, other questions? Yes. Alex. Alex down here. Uh, here. Uh, Did you listen to your iPhone during you. my speech? <laughs> <laughs> In rapt attention the whole time. All right. I, I could see. <laughs> uh, Alex Peterson, I think yep. I've been mentioned a couple of times. Yep. Um, uh, you mentioned TAP, uh, uh, TAPI, I should say. I'm sorry. Uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. Um, should we view this, even though it's heading in a sort of opposite direction of uh, Europe and what you might call the West, should we still view it as a key piece of uh, transatlantic energy security, if you will, uh, because of the Afghanistan element and because it diversifies Turkmen uh, natural gas away from uh, flowing through Russia? Uh, <clears throat> I think I have to give you a somewhat extended answer on that, but pull out the hook if I'm talking too long. Uh, I don't know that I would consider it part of, I guess it's in the definition, transit, uh, transatlantic energy, an issue on transatlantic energy security. It's certainly an issue relating to energy security. Uh, I don't see, even if this project were to be successful, and there are many questions with respect to that, that it would be competitive with Europe because as I mentioned earlier I don't see any time real soon that Turkmen gas is going to be going west uh, and if it and if that situation changes and Turkmen gas does go west uh, that uh, there's plenty of gas in Turkmenistan uh, to uh, supply uh, all needs we haven't thought of it in terms of uh, deflecting uh, energy from going to Russia or China. Uh, again, I think there's plenty of gas in Turkmenistan to go to all of these places. Russia has the capacity to bring in 50 BCM of gas today uh, from Turkmenistan, and as I understand it, they're only, you know, they're only uh, importing about 10 BCM. Uh, there, there's a question how much gas ultimately will go to China. We hope a lot will go to China because it, environmentally it'll be helpful and open up other supplies of gas. Uh, but again, it's going to be competing with coal. China will be driving a hard bargain on prices. You know, we have to see <clears throat> how that all develops. Um, with respect to TAPI itself, are you looking for my comments on the viability of that? Or uh, uh, That would be interesting, yes. Well, okay. I, well, maybe since if that wasn't part of the question, maybe I shouldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll say something on that. Um, for the, the, Many of you may know that this was a pipeline a concept that was developed years ago by Unical uh, before uh, Chevron uh, purchased it. And when I was doing the Caspian job 12 years ago, I thought the whole idea was totally insane. Um, and I don't anymore, and we don't, uh, uh, we don't feel that way about it. There are clearly serious issues like security, uh, commercial issues. Uh, but I will give credit uh, where it's deserved to President Bertie Mukhamedov. He's really run with this idea. Uh, he's worked with 
the three other countries. They've had experts meetings. They've reached uh, heads of agreement as to the project. He claims that he's going to have a summit meeting in Ashgabat in December with the, with the leaders of Pakistan, India, uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, and there's a question as to how what companies would get involved or who would get involved, given the various commercial and you know security risks and so on. But that you know can be worked out over a period of time. So yeah, there are a lot of issues. Uh, but I learned to say when uh, uh, the Russians and the Turks built the Blue Stream pipeline from Russia to Turkey across the Black Sea in the late 90s, never to say never. So I'm certainly not going to say never on this. Uh, it's a possibility. If it were ever successful, it would be a total home run, uh, both from a commercial standpoint and from a political standpoint uh, as to the relations between the countries uh, in the region. So it's something we're going to pay very careful attention to. Uh, yes, uh, Will. <clears throat> You, you talked about how fluid the situation was. Um, just to pick up on one point, uh, there has been a, cha uh, a change of president in Ukraine, and the relationship between Russia and, and Ukraine it looks like it's going to change over the next uh, few years. Does that change uh, the U.S. working relationship with Ukraine on these matters? Well, <coughs> I don't know if I'd use the word change. Uh, we're certainly going to try to work and are working with the government of Ukraine uh, on energy issues. Uh, I've spent a lot of time already with uh, their energy minister, Boyko, as well as uh, other, uh, uh, other members of the Yanukovych uh, government. Uh, the, I, I think there are a couple of factors that are, that are very important. I think that the leaders, the new leaders in Ukraine, at least in those who are involved in the energy area, uh, are very smart and I think they're practical, I think they're transactional. And I think we just have to recognize that that's, you know, how to deal with them. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, they recognize they don't want to be, you know, the little brother in the relationship with Russia. They want to have their own energy security uh, and recognize that to do that, they need to develop uh, projects uh, on you know in unconventional technologies like shale and coal bed methane. They're looking at offshore Black Sea projects, and they need Western technology and finance in order to do that. Uh, they also recognize that Western companies are not going to get involved in any of these projects without a change in the investment climate, uh, and we've worked with them on that. And they are taking steps uh, to improve the investment climate. Companies are reporting that things, at least in their negotiations, uh, things are improving. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that can be, if, if successful, that can be very important for Ukraine. The other thing that, is, uh, that Ukraine has made very clear, uh, which is that is in spite of uh, their, quote, new relationship with Russia, that they view South Stream, which would circumvent Ukraine as a transit country, uh, they would call it literally an existential threat. And they're looking for help from their European friends, and I guess from us to an extent, to help with respect to the South Stream issue. And there are plenty of regulatory issues in Europe that do relate to South Stream. But setting that aside, the, real, the answer to that is that they need to modernize their transit system in a sustainable way that would make unnecessary uh, circumvention uh, uh, of Ukraine. And in order to do that and to get the financing for that, uh, and there is financing available from the international financial institutions, they do have to uh, take, take reform steps that they should have taken long ago. They've done some things. They've uh, uh, enacted a new gas law, a new procurement law. They've raised their energy prices by uh, 50 percent, and I was assured last week when I saw the Deputy Prime Minister Tahipko that that's actually appearing on bills at this point. 
although they, they are rightly working with the World Bank on targeted subsidies for people who can't afford it. So they're, they're doing at least a lot of, they're now part of the European energy community, which would uh, require them to follow EU acquis. So, you know, we've had a lot of disappointment in dealing with Ukraine in the past on these issues. We may again, but we hope not. Uh, again, a, it's a, a glass half full, and we have to see if their words will turn into actions. And hopefully, uh, they'll avoid. They, you know, Russia is very important, and they need to have a good relationship with Russia. But hopefully, whatever that relationship will be, will be fair and transparent. Uh, that question was asked by Will Pomerantz, who's the deputy director of the Kennan Institute here at the center. Uh, Dr. Christian Osterman is the uh, uh, the uh, uh, director of European studies here, and he is the one leading this uh, European Energy Security Initiative at the center. Um, and it's uh, his his vision and his leadership that's going to be very important. On it. he wanted to ask a question, Christian. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, this very interesting talk. Uh, that launches, in fact, this initiative, and we're delighted that um, uh, you are helping us to do so. Uh, two questions. I'd like to uh, push you a little bit on um, the issue of why is this important to Americans. We're in an election season. Uh, we all take it for granted in this room. I'm sure that this is uh, European energy security is an important issue. But what's, what difference does it make to uh, Americans out there? Uh, could you... Uh, um, talk about that in more specific, concrete terms. Secondly, Turkey's role in the Southern Energy Corridor. Uh, how do you see that role evolving? What concerns does the administration have? And how do you see that this will affect, change Turkey's relationship uh, with the EU? Thank you. Okay, I'll, if I forget any aspect of it, <laughs> prompt me. Um, why do we care? And uh, I'm asked that question a lot. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd say at, at least three factors, one of which I already alluded to, uh, that uh, we are inextricably linked economically. And one of the bigger threats to the European economy, and ours uh, ultimately, is energy security. Uh, so that uh, an energy secure, I said it before, an energy secure Europe is in our interest as, as, well, as, uh, as well as vice versa. Uh, and that we feel that, it's, that the whole concept of diversification is really important, and that countries whether or not they be Central and Eastern European countries or other European countries or countries in the Caucasus and Central Asia, Turkey for that matter, all should be able to make the appropriate, make their decisions um, with respect to energy resources uh, as they want to make it without, you know, without any kind of pressure. So that uh, if Turkmenistan uh, decides that uh, th that they want to ship, this would re you know could relate to Bulgaria as well. Uh, but if Turkmenistan, for example, it's not that we're trying to interfere in Russian space in Central Asia. All we're saying is that a country like Turkmenistan or a country like Azerbaijan should be able to make its own decisions, whatever those decisions may be, uh, which uh, we should accept that countries in Central and Eastern Europe should make their own decisions with respect to how they balance their energy policy uh, uh, in, a way that, you know, in a way that they see fit. So f for those reasons, it's important. We think it will develop uh, uh, the countries, uh, the economies in countries like Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan, for example. The more resources that are available through uh, the Southern Corridor, uh, and from those countries are going to open up resources in other parts of the world. That's why, you know, it's not just Europe. We, it is it potentially a good thing what Turkmenistan is doing with China from an environmental standpoint, uh, from uh, opening, up other, uh, opening up other supplies. We think China needs to maybe do more with respect to local content, labor practices, uh, and the like. But, you know, that's, those are other issues. 
Um, so I guess in short, that's why we, uh, that's why we care. Um, with respect to Turkey, I covered the first question, right? With respect to Turkey, uh, we have a very good relationship with them in the energy area, and we uh, are pretty much, you know, we're, we're pretty much in agreement. We we agree, for example, on how to deal with the Iraq Kurdish situation. Uh, uh, we were certainly strong proponents of the agreement with Azerbaijan. We uh, recognize that Turkey is going to be an important uh, transit country. We've been able to work with them in the past. We There are issues. Uh, I think that there are issues for projects like ITGI, which would depend on an agreement with Botash uh, on how to modernize the Turkish infrastructure. That's not going to be easy to work out. Who's going to pay what? Uh, uh, how easy is it going to be to actually negotiate an agreement? We'll, you know, we'll see uh, as 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 that uh, uh, as that develops. Um, with respect to the overall relationship with the United States, we've made and Turkey has made the very conscious decision. Yeah, we've had difficulties. I mean, obviously, in the past several months on any number of issues, but we're going to work as hard as we can together on the issues that we can agree on. Energy being one of them. Uh, the whole Turkey EU question is, <laughs> I mean, that's just a, a difficult question. And, you know, certainly cooperation in energy is not going to hurt the relationship between Turkey and the EU. How much that becomes an influence in improved relations uh, and maybe ultimately accession uh, is a whole other question. Um, Marios, did you want to ask a question in the back? Uh, in the back? One of our scholars here, identify yourself. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Mario Timiopoulos. I'm with the Southeast Europe Project. Um, I would like to ask you um, a brief question in relevance to energy security uh, and respectfully with NATO. Um, the fact that NATO is keen into getting engaged to the operational field of security policy, do you think that actually the United States could do something in initiating some sort of operational planning procedure, practical one, so that NATO can be involved, let us say, into the Nabucco uh, project or the South Stream in this case. Thank you very much. The, the whole question of NATO and energy security, I might also add OSCE and energy security, uh, is a difficult one. Uh, NATO is a consensus organization uh, getting agreement on what a, an energy security program would be within NATO uh, would be, I think, would be a formidable task. Uh, I think it would be extremely unlikely that NATO would ever get involved from a direct military standpoint. NATO could get involved from the standpoint of, uh, in theory, and they haven't made any decision to this effect, but I suppose they could get involved with respect to giving assistance, with respect to, uh, to countries that are interested in, um, uh, in, uh, in pipeline security, for example, but not in any direct, you know, not in any direct, I would doubt in any direct military way. It could encourage uh, its members uh, to go back to their governments to recognize that uh, energy security is a political security issue as well uh, and uh, that, that have, to have to deal with it that way. They could encourage the kinds of things that we're talking about with respect to building interconnectors within various countries. But I, I, I think it's legitimate for NATO to get involved uh, because it is a political security issue, but it's a question as to uh, how much uh, it will get involved given the consensus nature of the organization and what, in fact, is doable. Uh, Christina, the gentleman uh, right there. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Keat, uh, also from the State Department. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, the other day at SICE, you were talking about the possibility of the United States becoming a gas exporter to the European Union and I would assume perhaps other parts of Europe. Uh, if this comes to pass, how will this affect the financial viability of projects for exporting gas from the Caspian Sea region into Europe? A good question, and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and I'm not exactly sure why I didn't include that point today. Uh, but the, the, the point is that 
uh, there is the possibility of the U.S. becoming a net exporter uh, of gas as a result of the shale developments here. There are companies that are seeking licenses that would allow them to trans, basically to take LNG terminals that are built for import and to convert it so that they could actually export LNG that would be made uh, from, you know, from the shale production uh, and ship it to Europe. And if you believe some of these companies, uh, you know, they could conceivably be exporting 20, 30, 40 BCM uh, over the next, uh, you know, I don't know how long it'll take, three, four, five years, whatever length of time it would take. Uh, and that's the size of a, you know, that's the same size as a Nabucco pipeline, uh, if full. So uh, I think also, though, when they're talking about exporting 20, 30, or 40 BCM, it's not necessarily just to Europe. It can be to other places as well. So I don't think, I think it's speculation at this point as to how much would go to Europe. Yeah, it could have an effect, uh, but I don't think it's yet having an effect on any planning with respect to specific projects, specific other projects that are taking place. But we could all be surprised, just like we've been surprised by what happened in the U.S., and it's something that has to be taken into account. Uh, the gentleman in there. Thank you, Quentin Cantu, uh, Raptor Strategies here in Washington. Mr. Ambassador, I find it interesting, um, your comment about the the decreasing prevalence of zero-sum interest when it comes to energy security in this region. Um, <clears throat> I find it, however, I do find it undeniable that a lot of these projects inevitably involve zero-sum interest and regional rivalries, uh, the BTC pipeline in Georgia and Russia probably being the most notable example. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the administration's navigation of, of these rivalries, how it's navigating certain projects over others and its policy towards that issue. Thank you. Uh, it's a good question. I, I might say, and I think maybe it's not worth getting into it here, but I, I could make an argument anyway that BTC was not totally a zero-sum project, although I understand why you might interpret it that way. I think the Russians might interpret it that way. I don't think we would. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's hard, and you know, politics still play, certainly still play a role. I think that it's really important that we all, in, it, particularly given the change in the financial climate, uh, that we make every effort to start talking and cooperating more. Uh, I think that's particularly true in our relationship with Russia on these issues. We literally, I don't believe that we engaged with Russia on energy issues for many years. We are now. I think, and I think it may take more years to change uh, or for attitudes uh, to evolve uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to these issues. Uh, I, I mean, I could see down the road, given the changing marketplace, maybe a whole new configuration with respect to uh, some of these pipelines. Um, for example, uh, if Ukraine could clean up its act and come to uh, and, and, and modernize its own system in a, in a reasonable way, in a transparent way, therefore eliminating the need for a South Stream or the perceived need uh, for a South Stream, uh, I could see a situation where Ukraine continued to be a major transit country. Russia has the ability, even today, to participate in the Southern Corridor. 50% uh, of Nabucco gas is up for competitive uh, bidding, if Nabucco ends up being the, uh, being the project. This actually could help the project, I suppose. Uh, Russia could be a supplier uh, to Nabucco. But I think what's going to be important is that W that given the changes in the marketplace, that there be an understanding of all parties that and that it's not necessary to control uh, to be have a controlling interest in everything that in acting like businesses uh, you can you know you could be a minority supplier and still be you know in a win win kind of situation uh, and if we figured out a way. Over time, and I'm I, I'm not bringing my life savings to Las Vegas and betting that this will happen, uh, but over a period of some years, uh, 
if we can learn to cooperate more, and and the and when I, it's not governments, just governments, companies as well, uh, I think we could see uh, I think we could see some real progress. Uh, there are a lot of uh, there there are a lot of new projects that are taking place with the Russians. Chevron announced a project with Rosneft, I guess, uh, off you know, the Black Sea. I think there's going to be more investment in Russia. I, I think there are some I think there are some real opportunities going down the road if everybody's open minded. Maybe naive, but we'll see. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yes. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, my name is Deriga Chukmaitova. I'm a PhD candidate and a visiting scholar at GW, and I'm from Kazakhstan. So I was wondering if you could please comment a little bit more on um, U.S.-Kazakhstan relations towards, and whether Kazakhstan is still is considered a strategic partner in energy and security. Well, Kazakhstan certainly is considered a strategic partner there, and we've had a good relationship on energy uh, over the years. Uh, there have been issues that have developed uh, uh, over the past several months and uh, business issues that have developed between the companies that have invested and and uh, and uh, uh, Kazakhstan the Kazakhstan government as well as uh, uh, their energy company Kazmuni Gas I guess um, and those are issues that need to be worked out between the parties. And the only what we've been encouraging, and we haven't taken sides in the disputes, but just encouraging the parties to negotiate in good faith and come to resolution. There have been some, and there's been some progress on that. Um, we have raised issues uh, about uh, maybe some heavy-handed practices during these negotiations towards individuals who work for some of these companies. Uh, I think that's abated. Uh, I think that they've, the government has recognized the concerns, and uh, I think that situation is somewhat better, but hopefully permanently better. Uh, but overall, I think the relationship is good, and all that, and that what we need again, we need to encourage the companies and Kazakh companies and government ministries to negotiate in good faith and come to reasonable solutions. We also feel it's very important, and although I think it's, I think there have been some delays in working with Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan to ensure oil, as I mentioned in my speech, oil deliveries uh, across the Caspian. Uh, the lady in the second row, yes. Um, my name is Irina Erevitz, Global Affairs Program, George Mason University, and I have a very quick question, but. <laughs> Maybe it requires a long answer. What's the role of Africa and Nigeria is the first country that comes to mind in this uh, U.S.-EU sec uh, energy security nexus? It's really interesting that you asked that question, uh, and I don't, I don't have a long answer, uh, but it is an issue, and in our political in our energy security dialogue with the EU we do talk about Nigeria it, it hasn't been to you know at this point in any great depth within the State Department I'm not I'm responsible for Eurasia and not for Nigeria but uh, but it is something that's been a topic of discussion and will be more of a discussion what's inter why it was interesting that why it's interesting that you ask that question is that one of the things that we hope that the energy council will do is deal with businesses and we've been requested by businesses to look at uh, investment climates in various countries uh, including within the region I'm involved with, but Nigeria was one of the was a country that they specifically asked for. So I think you're going to probably see if if I come back here a year from now and you're here, I'll probably have a lot more to say about it. Uh, perhaps the last question there. Yes, Mr. Ambassador Gary Waxmanski from EPA. Um, as someone, a friend from the past. <laughs> as someone who's been um, dealing with the Russians for a long time, have you? seen anything in your recent experience that would lead us to believe that the current government, Medvedev, Putin, whoever, are really starting to take the efficiency issue seriously, um, either because of, and if so, you know, does climate change have anything to do with it, or are they simply finally coming around to, a, you know, a different practical approach to uh, energy economics? I'm probably not the best judge of that, but I did have a conversation uh, just recently with our mutual friend John Elkind who just uh, returned from Russia and he was actually quite ecstatic with how uh, if, as, as much as John can be uh, about 
Russia's positive approach towards energy efficiency. They see this, uh, this is a major uh, part of the uh, overall U.S.-Russia energy working group. Uh, DOE is spending a lot of time on it. Uh, they feel like they're making progress, and I think the Russians, more from a practical standpoint, realize how important uh, this can be uh, for them. So we are we are hopeful, and I, I think certainly Medvedev uh, uh, thinks it's a, a very important issue. We'll see, but uh, the signs are good. Um, I just uh, want to thank everybody for being here, asking very good questions, the, um, and help us with this launch of this uh, European Energy uh, Security Initiative. Uh, I believe, I don't know, but I believe there's a sign-up sheet out there if you want to give us your coordinates to be informed of um, future events. And let's all give Ambassador Morningstar a, a round of applause. He did a very good job on a lot of very complicated issues. Thank you for being with us here this morning. Thank you, and thank you for all of your questions. Thank you. That was great. Good. <laughs> really appreciate it.